Fountain. That's better. Uh, so where to start? Um, the, uh, the notion that courts, um, and I suppose lawyers, end up in the middle of political disputes is not a particularly new. Uh, the person who I think of as the most powerful political um, analyst, analyst of the American political system, uh, de Tocqueville, published Democracy in, the Amer in America. Keep in mind, 40, only 44 years after we uh, ratified the court, the Constitution, and a, a, a phrase he's, a sentence he's quite famous for, scarcely any political question arises in the United States that is not resolved sooner or later uh, into a judicial question. We see that happening in the public pension uh, area, in the deficit area, and I think that's why, uh, that's why uh, Peter uh, and I are there. Um, the funding deficit for public employees' pensions is a crisis, um, a crisis measured by the perceived impact on municipal and state budgets. Uh, and, of course, as Tocqueville claimed, they're in the courts, just down the road, uh, San Jose's a good example, and it frames, uh, it frames our issue. That is, what actually is the role of courts in setting the parameters for how these issues are resolved? Because in the end, the power of the numbers, whether they're Joe's numbers or adjusted by other numbers, the power of those numbers in the end are going to get refracted through the judicial system. So what we're trying to present is some sense about how uh, the uh, judicial system ought to approach this. Now, the second point uh, about framing, uh, if we talk about the, the role of courts uh, in uh, dealing with uh, uh, these issues, you know, it's a lot like the old Henny Youngman joke, the sort of one-line stand-up uh, comic who worked on the basis of timing. So the, one, of his, one of his classics was somebody walked up to him and says, Henny, Henny, how's your spouse? He says, without a pause, he says, compared to what? When we talk about the courts, it's not the courts in the abstract. It's the courts in relationship to alternative inst political institutions that have the capacity to act. And in a, you know, a little bit like a Picasso line drawing, if we define the courts, we're by reference defining uh, the other uh, institutional roles. Now, the thing for us to keep in mind is there are different kinds of crises. And you know, for us, the cut is exogenous and endogenous. The exogenous uh, crises, which has taken a lot of attention in the current literature, um, are things that we're familiar with. 9-11 is an exogenous crisis. We didn't cause it. In many respects, at least operationally, we didn't call the, cause the financial uh, crisis either, the way the shadow banking system responded was at least immediate outside the political system. But fiscal crises are endogenous. The interest, the political process is both the source of the crisis, that is, the continued unwillingness to fund when the, when the numbers require it. That, um, that, so the political process becomes both the source of the crisis and then when the crisis comes root, it becomes a first responder. What we're going to talk about is the role of the courts in that, in that context, where we've got, um, where we're talking about a political crisis, a, a, a fiscal crisis where, in fact, the people who caused it, in turn, become the people um, who have to address it. What we're going to frame, and then I'm going to complete the framing, and then I'm going to sit down and let Peter uh, talk. Uh, courts are generally institutionally ill-suited to resolve fiscal crises. Uh, they lack fact-finding ability. They are limited to the evidence that puts, that's put before them. The evidence is presented in an adversarial way. Uh, many in this room, I suspect, have been expert witnesses in litigation, and in those circumstances may often be surprised by what the expert on the other side is willing to say and sometimes the opposite as well. Um, it's not fact-finding. It's adversarial presentation of facts which leaves the courts um, in a difficult fashion in which they can't get the information uh, that they want. Uh, they also mostly lack uh, the political branch's democratic legitimacy. In the federal courts, it's easy. People are, um, people are uh, appointed for life. 
I spent the first two thirds of my constitutional law course on one case trying to explain how it was that you had politically unrepresentative judges who could overturn, who could hold unconstitutional decisions by the political branch. The question didn't get easier with the passage of time. Um, but nonetheless, despite their ill-suitedness, there's still a legal issue, and the one that Peter's uh, going to address, uh, do California and the US constitutions protect pension commitments from adjustment? And in particular, um, that issue we're going to suggest defines the extent of the fiscal resolution and ends up putting the courts at the center of it. Because if there's a constitutional claim that the political agencies can't touch the commitments going forward, then it constrains, um, uh, and, uh, it constrains uh, our options. And this is where the little nod uh, to economics is going to come in, though there's more, there's, there's more to it than we'll have time for. Uh, what actually is the contract? When the court considers whether the contract clause applies to something, what actually is the contract and how do they construct it? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Ron, and thank you to Seifer and John for uh, the chance to be here. Um, you might also be wondering, in addition to um, whether other, other questions you have about the paper, is what are a couple of lawyers doing here? Um, and I think the, uh, a short answer to that before uh, John read the paper might have been to give us some answers about law. So I want to say uh, at the outset, as I continue to develop this, this uh, essay, or the, the the, which is essentially a law review article, perhaps better suited to a law type conference, that I would like during question and answer, if you have questions about the substance of the California rule, the nature of the San Jose litigation, um, municipal bankruptcy and its option in adjusting um, uh, pension uh, benefits, modifying those benefits, we'd, I'd be very happy to talk about that. That's within the area of, uh, of uh, scholarly work that we're doing. And San Jose is going to come up, actually, as we discuss this. Um, so uh, here we go. So it's just a graphical demonstration of what you'd see in a, a perfectly functioning political system. Um, and we think this is um, not really a, a, a positive assessment. There's a bit of, of a normative angle to this, too, which is just that if we're going to have what we're calling institutional competence, we're looking at two different dimensions, one of fact-finding ability and the other of democratic legitimacy. And in the stuff of policy, fiscal-making apparatus, who gets what, how do you allocate how much, uh, uh, what are the benefits, who, who gets uh, when those resources are scarce, uh, who gets the short end of which sticks. This is a political process. Uh, and in a democracy, it's something where you want to have a check on that process with, uh, with people who can you know, vote the bums out if, uh, if the people don't like the results of that political determination. So here's our, our uh, impressionistic allocation of where the different institutions would lie if each institution or process is functioning as it, would, as it should be. Um, with democratic legitimacy, obviously, the political branches are going to be much higher than various courts, and courts are not all the same with respect to democratic legitimacy. So the, the question that has seen scholars in the exogenous crisis perspective, uh, recognizing, of course, that there's bleed over between exogenous and endogenous crises, is what's the ju judiciary going to do? Is the judiciary going to stand up and say to the president in the time of uh, terrorist attacks, actually, you can't violate those civil rights because the Constitution says X, Y, or Z? A lot of scholars say absolutely not. They're just going to defer. And there's a debate about that. The problem is, is that how do you defer to the actor that has caused the crisis that is before you? And that's the question that we're taking up in this paper. It's a decision rule for hard cases where the institutional process is broken. Now, that institutional process could be broken in one of two ways. One, it's broken just because there's such political dysfunction. That the political process has created the crisis and cannot uncreate it because of specific political pathologies. Or it's the strategic invocation of the court's jurisdiction to continue the political process. It's not broken so much as it is an attempt to gain an advantage. So either the political branch will sue 
public employees or bondholders or bondholders or public employees will sue the political branches, and that just brings the court into the system strategically. The problem is a court, when it's faced with this litigation, cannot know. Is this litigation before us because the political process is broken? Or is it before us because they're strategically invoking our jurisdiction and are just using us as pawns in this chess game of chess? So what? Do, so that's that's the question. That's the scenario that we we are confronted in California. And the question for uh, legal academics is both a a predictive one to say, well, what are courts going to do? But it's also a prescriptive one to say, well, what what should courts do? What are a, what's a, a heuristic, a decision rule? to assist courts in confronting this kind of political dysfunction when their jurisdiction is invoked to participate in a political process, how should the court respond? Three options. One is non-intervention. Say we have no jurisdiction. There are a series of doctrines in law, political question doctrine, justiciability, uh, a fancy word to say, oh, you don't have standing to bring this suit. The suit isn't right before us. Actually, the suit is moot, it should already have been resolved, a series of others. But if th none of those doctrines apply, and as a legal matter they don't in this context, you're left with two other options as a court. One is you've got to resolve the, the, uh, the problem before you. You can do it using non-constitutional resolution, which is to say we interpret this statute in this way. If we are wrong, political branches can tell us that we are wrong. Or there's a constitutional resolution which says, we're going to decide this case and make it so that the political branches can't correct us absent constitutional amendment. Now, the California rule is the rule in, in California, it's appropriately named, um, that says that for public employees, the benefits of their pension guarantees, but not their compensation, are fixed at the, uh, the date from their first day of work, according to the schedule of those pension accruals in place on that day, such that the US and California constitutions, which have a contracts clause, which says that states can't impair private contracts, those contract clauses protect those pension guarantees even prospectively. So it's not a controversial position of the law really anywhere that for work already done, if, I'm, if I've been working as a public employee for uh, 20 years and according to the schedule I have vested benefit rights, or vested, vested benefit compensation uh, title to those 22 years, then, uh, then that is protected by the, con the contracts clause. What is controversial and is the law in California and 12 other states is what do you do with the prospective promises. So I'm a 20 year employee, I've got 10 years left that I want to work and according to the accrual schedule I'm going to get uh, so many percentage uh, of my annual salary to accrue prospectively. Can the state adjust that prospective schedule? In most states of the union, the answer is yes. In California and 12 others, the answer is no. And so that's the, that's the California rule that we're, we're addressing here. Um, and there's a, a, an aspect to which this rule is very easy, and there is an aspect where it's very difficult. Now, courts have looked at contract clause uh, since the early 19th century, and there's a, a robust set of cases that, uh, in federal court to uh, guide courts in resolving these kinds of, of questions. It's a three-step process. Is there a contract? Is, has the state impaired that contract, and was that impairment justified um, by, uh, by exigent circumstances. It's a very loose standard, um, and you could see it being no standard at all, um, depending on, on the context. But in a sense, the contract clause actually by the first step is asking the question of not only is there a contract, but what are the terms of that contract? So, here's, so we look at, there, there are easy cases and there are hard cases in the pension context. An easy case is where the contract that defines the public employment relationship, which includes city charters, for example, expressly says that the city can adjust upward or downward pension, prospective pension guarantees. Now that forms the basis of the contract, and that is the heart of the litigation in San Jose. Um, uh, Josh alluded to the San Jose uh, case earlier. 
And that is under litigation. We're expecting an opinion within the next three months. And the, the public employees have argued that despite San Jose's charter, uh, the California rule still applies and that they are uh, guaranteed that their prospective benefits uh, are, are fixed and subject to constitutional protection. Uh, we think that's an easy case. We think the public employees lose. Uh, we'll see if the California courts agree with us. Um, but it's, uh, it's an easy case because we've got to look again to what the terms of the contract say. In this sense, the terms of the contract are statutory, including a city charter. What do you do, though, when there is no such city charter? And the only thing that you have to go on here is, uh, in terms of the public contract, are the contract with the employees, either individually defined or a collective bargaining agreement, and the, uh, the schedule itself. Well, in that sense, it's like any other executory contract. And so you look at the t length of that contract and determine when those contracts are fully executory, meaning that there's work to be done on both sides, uh, what are the terms of that executory contract? Now, here's the place where reason people disagree. Is this a hard case or an easy case? Is the California rule made up by venal judges who are interested in protecting their own pensions? Or is it a legitimate attempt to grapple with a hard question with whether or not perspective, or whether or not a schedule that tells me as I sign up for my first day of work as a public employee uh, what I can expect from that employment? Is that part of the contract or not? We say that even if you accept that it's a hard question, that what we need to look at, I'm just going to skip through a little bit to, to make this a little bit faster, what you need to look at is the sense that being a hard question and considering that uh, where, where the judiciary sits in this distribution of institutional competence and legitimacy, then the correct answer is the intermediate one a non-constitutional resolution. In this case, by the nature of this, the structure of this litigation requires that the non-constitutional determination is against the public employees. And in a sense, that could be random. I mean, that could be, it didn't have to be in that direction, it could be in the other. The point is, this is not a partisan rule that we're looking at. We're looking at a rule that gets the judiciary out of the business of fiscal policy making and pushes that fiscal policy making process back into the hands of political branches, dysfunctional though they may be. Um, it, Churchill is invoked for many things, and this uh, um, uh, most uh, common among them is that democracy is terrible except for everything else, and this is the democratic process. Pathologies that are, uh, uh, infiltrate the, the public employment uh, benefit negotiation process, notwithstanding, it's better to have the judiciary resolve the question in a way that can be revisited. Constitutionalizing the issue fixes in place a, a determination uh, for time immemorial and makes it so that the re revision of that decision um, cannot be done in the usual political way. And indeed, and I'll conclude on this note, that the San Jose case, I think, it represents the very best of what you'd ha expect to see from a political process. San Jose is not Detroit. Right? San Jose is looking prospectively and saying, we are not going to be able to pay these bills as they come due five years from now, ten years from now. They're not saying, we cannot pay these bills as they come due today. You would want to see that from your political leaders, right? That kind of forward thinking work. Here's the problem with the California rule, in even the San Jose case, where, I, where we think that the California rule is not even relevant to that legal determination. Mayor Reed is also engaged in an effort to amend the Constitution to overrule the California rule. Right? And your initial reaction is like, okay, well, the courts have created a rule of state constitutional law. If Mayor Reed is successful, then the people, by, by initiative, are going to overturn that rule. It's not as easy as that. There could be federal constitutional implications of a state initiative that overrules a pension guarantee, even one created by the judiciary. In other words, if the contract clause protects a contract, and that contract is defined by state judges, and then the people, by constitutional amendment, impair that contract, hasn't that constitutional amendment itself violated the contract's clause? This is a tricky constitutional issue, and it's tricky because the judges didn't follow 
our advice that we weren't around to give them at the time. <laughs> and that is that when you're in the fiscal policy making context, tread lightly. Tread lightly. Don't constitutionalize. That's, uh, and and uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Ted. I should say it, it's a particular pleasure to welcome Ted Groom. Ted and I probably organized at least 15 conferences over the last 30 years. And uh, so we worked very closely together for over a very long time, period of time, and it's always been a pleasure. Thank you very much, John. I sort of wondered why John had asked me to uh, participate in this. It's not a subject in which I claim great expertise. Uh, and then it occurred to me, uh, working longer, uh, living longer and working longer. Oh, well, let's see. <coughs> I've worked longer than most lawyers I know. I'm, I've worked over 50 years as a member of the bar. <laughs> You would have done better if you had gone after George Schultz. So, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, John. Um, I uh, have talked with Peter and uh, Rowan about this subject, and I've offered uh, a whole bunch of sort of questions that they might consider. And uh, those are actually printed up, and there are copies out uh, uh, there. And I'm not going to get into them. A lot, of, a lot of them are just simply questions. Uh, it seems to be very popular these days to, by some to say, let's have a conversation about this issue. And so I thought maybe we would have a conversation about this issue. Uh, and really, I was going to talk about three things. Uh, the first uh, was the uh, California rule and the concepts they were doing there, and actually, it seemed very important that you have a flexibility on the part of the policymakers to not only increase benefits but to decrease benefits. And when you can't even decrease benefits that have not currently accrued, then that puts you uh, in a uh, very difficult situation. You don't have as so much flexibility uh, to uh, uh, take different actions. Their basic uh, framework, uh, here I was wondering, I'm missing the point somehow or other, because I, I thought their basic framework was, uh, or thesis was, <clears throat> uh, don't decide issues on constitutional grounds because, as Ron says, it precludes you from dealing with that issue in the future, uh, except for the very difficult process of amending constitutions. Uh, and uh, basically, keep the judges out of it as much as possible. Uh, I thought in a very simple-minded way that was uh, two basics that they had. And it is one that really is sort of uh, consistent with general uh, jurisprudence, I think. Uh, that. Uh, uh, you should only go to the Constitution when you can't decide the issue on some other basis. Um, so I was a little bit unsure of exactly what they were trying to accomplish here. Uh, and, and maybe that's because I'm not quite as familiar with everything that's going on in California. Um, the, uh, but I had a sort of a reaction of so what to some, uh, some of the items. Um, it also seemed to me that the California rules based on a whole bunch of different cases. There's a very good uh, law review article, at least I thought it was uh, very good, by uh, Amy Moynihan. Uh, uh, Help me out. Thank you. Uh, Amy Moynihan, who's a uh, professor at the University of Iowa, uh, and uh, she has uh, uh, written a, a long and uh, persuasive article that, uh, to the effect that the California rule is wrong and uh, shouldn't be followed. Um, 
And one question I've sort of wondering uh, as far as what you guys were doing is uh, from a proactive standpoint, what do you do? How do, do you have clients that say, we want to have this ability? I've actually, believe it or not, at the beginning of RISA, did have clients represented the Western Conference of Teamsters Pension Plan. They did want to have the ability not only to decrease benefits, but to decrease them if necessary, believe it or not. There's a very limited provision in ERISA that allows multi-employer pension plans to do that. But ERISA does not require you in any event to uh, uh, be uh, stuck with uh, future accruals based on uh, what, what, what the pension regime was on your first day of uh, employment. I want to switch a little bit from or, or, uh, your, your general, I mean, the, this whole idea of looking at public pension plans was sort of an example of dealing with fiscal crises. And uh, we're very lucky uh, in that we have some of those going on. Uh, and so perhaps maybe we shouldn't just talk about ERISA, but maybe we ought to talk, or public plans, we might talk about other things. Uh, I, I was hoping to hear somebody quantify. It seemed to me maybe Militia did some work in this area. Uh, so what is the amount of the, uh, the, estim the best, best estimate of unfunded uh, public employee liabilities, and how does that compare? to uh, private sector. Uh, you, you do see that uh, numbers like one trillion, I read something last night that was four trillion, all sorts of big numbers. I, 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 and I don't have any confidence that I know the number. I know it's a big one. But, but it's not nearly as big as Medicare and Social Security, which are and also there are lots of different numbers there, uh, but you frequently see numbers of 40 trillion uh, uh, or greater. Um, the, uh, I was sort of interested in, uh, in, in, in the terms of how to deal with issues uh, and who, what, what, what the best forum is and keep it out of the courts but go political, which is part of your theme. I was reminded that uh, I gave a presentation to a CEPR group uh, that, that John had referred to earlier in 1996 on uh, how entitlements were going to kill the life insurance industry as well as, uh, <laughs> incidentally, the rest of us. Um, the, uh, the, and I went through you know, what the problem was with all of the entitlements. And at the time I did this in 1996, uh, what I was doing was not anything new. It was sort of, you know, I put together a lot of facts and statistics that were widely known at the time. Now that was 18 years ago. So then you say, well, we've known this about all these issues for 18 years. No, not 18 years, it's probably more like 30 or 40 years we've known about these issues. And what have we done? Well, our answer to that is we've increased the unfunded liability by having a, pres a prescription drug program, for example. Um, and uh, and uh, some of the current things in uh, the ACA uh, also have the effect of increasing the liability. We keep going through this silly thing on uh, not paying doctors what they should get paid, and of, uh, of uh, doctors. Every time I go in to see a doctor, I ask them what they think uh, about their practice, um, and would they encourage their children to go into it. And uh, for the most part, I get an answer that they wouldn't do it if they were starting over again from scratch. So I think it's a very uh, sort of uh, painful thing that's facing us now. An exciting issue is right in our midst 
or I think it's exciting. It's at least economically and actuarially exciting in terms of what is going to happen to ACA. For, forget whether you like it or not. What's going to happen to this current system? Is it going to blow up because uh, only people who, 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 who uh, elect uh, to go into the exchanges are sick people? Uh, do uh, the healthy young people not go into the system? Or maybe healthy old people don't go into the system? It's a really strange thing because uh, if this were a private uh, sector situation, you'd have to have some disclosure out there when you offered this to a young person, which is the value of what you are being offered uh, <coughs> it is uh, less than, uh, than uh, you may think in some way. It's, uh, it's uh, poor. So, we have, and this is no news to anybody, we have uh, here in the United States on entitlements and other things, uh, very, we, we've reached this point where we can't resolve anything politically. So if the judges aren't going to do it, uh, who is going to do it? Who's going to make some of these decisions? And, uh, and when you say you're going to push it out of the judiciary in, into some alternative form, how do you do that? And uh, is there a good way of doing that? Thanks very much. Very, very interesting presentation and discussion. I very interesting presentation discussion. I, I just had a few questions. So first of all, when I, I tell people I know about the, the California rule, they say to me, how can that possibly be? I mean, I haven't worked, you know, I haven't put in all the years of service that I'm going to work, and my employer, I mean, just take me, you know, Stanford can cut my salary any day. So, uh, you know, wh why would it be? Uh, why would it be the case that, uh, it, how does it make any sense that there's, um, uh, the, the benefits are protected prospectively, but prospective pay is is not is not protected. Just and also from an. Can I interrupt you for just a second? Yeah. Can you please use the podium microphone? Well, uh, yes. Uh, just before us old guys forget things very quickly, I so said before I forget this. Uh, a point I meant to make is there are a lot of things you can do about the California rule. You don't have to apply it to new hires, for example. I assume. You can also uh, you can also offer alternatives so long as the net thing you're providing to uh, the employee is uh, that doesn't decrease materially, and uh, so you could have a plan in which you say to your employees, we we've got news for you, we're going to decrease everybody's salary next year by X unless you take, but we're also going to have this new benefit plan which provides in the present value that new benefit plan is actually greater. So you could do the reverse. You could you could cut the you, pension and increase You can go pay. either way, right. You can go either way. So, and I've wondered why there isn't more exploration of options of sort of circ circumventing California rule. Okay. Anyway, I guess my question is: It's very hard for me as an economist to understand how that, that this can be a rule when the person, the employee, hasn't put in the work yet. So that's question number one. Does somebody, somebody can just tell me what I should tell my friends about that? And then uh, the, um, the the second uh, thought that I had was just you know the way we've done this with pensions, you know there've been these defined benefit promises that were made without any contingent specification of what happens if the if the assets are way too large or way too small to cover. The benefits, and what we've done is, without making any specification about that, we've now left it to a system where we have to go to courts to determine what happens if the if the assets fall short. And just to me, it seems like the most costly recontracting structure one could ever imagine. And it just would, it seems like it would be, have been a lot more efficient to have specified some kind of ex ante risk sharing with these with these contracts, just to or, or just to say what happens if the assets fall short or if the assets uh, you know uh, sur sur surpass what's necessary to, to to pay the benefits. So I just 
I just think you know go, going forward, I, I just want to think about that and um, uh, and then also you know these questions about the numbers. Um, you know, of course, however many trillion, whatever the pensions is, is nothing compared to Medicare. But there's also a question of um, the workout mechanism and how much damage it does to financial markets to have to face these kinds of problems. I mean, I think, you know, because people rely on cities and uh, cities in particular for essential public services, and they rely on state governments and school districts for uh, for education. Um, it may not really be a big question whether the, whether it's a trillion or four trillion. Um, you know, it, it may be second order compared to uh, you know what, what's going to be the cost of the of the workout mechanism. You know, what, what's going to happen if you know muni markets refuse to lend to Chicago anymore? So, um, I guess those were just three thoughts I had about the very interesting presentation. George, uh, Bridget, I could ask questions for the next hour, <laughs> so I'll, I'll try and limit this. So the first one is is kind of a, an extension of Josh's question. So uh, if you have a gap between your assets and your liabilities, you could meet that gap by cutting, cutting what you have to pay out, or you could meet the gap by increasing the money that's going into the system. And it seems like all of the discussion is about how hard it is legally to cut the benefits, even the prospective benefits going forward. Given this distinction between compensation and benefits going forward, is there also a distinction between uh, benefits versus contributions. Could we solve the problem by increasing the contributions, not that the state has to make, but that the employees have to make to their, to their own benefits? That would seem straightforward to me. Um, the next question, uh, since you, you brought up the Detroit bankruptcy, is, is does, wh what does bankruptcy buy you? Obviously, no one wants to get into the position of a bankruptcy, but does it make it easier to change these contracts, and, and is that a universal, or, or how much is it going to depend on um, uh, specific laws in one state versus another. And then third, the, the San Jose ballot measure passed with a 70%, I mean, that's, that's overwhelming public support. Um, how hard would it be to get, uh, you know, a reasonable constitutional reforms, you know, and I understand the, the, you know, the issues Peter brought up at the end of his talk, but, but um, why isn't there more push on that front if there is this widespread public support to kind of get these fiscal problems under control. Okay. okay well, let me uh, first respond to Josh's question, which is, which I take to be is, how can this be? Who would make such an idiot out of country? Um, I think there's a perfectly straightforward reason, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a, you know, a very, very simple uh, model of this uh, of this contract that lots of people in this room will do better than I do. But let's talk about real people. So we've got on two side, we've got two people making the contracts: employees who are probably risk averse, as Alice suggests, and a public official. And the choice they're making is how much do they pay out now, which means the public officials got to either tax it, or shift, uh, or shift up uh, expenditures from some other group will be upset. Or if they're tough enough, take a strike. The, the alternative is you push it off. That is, you agree to pay the employees somewhat more, in, a, in effect, the surplus to the, to the public official of pushing it off so that you're paying more than, more than their discount rate. And for purposes of the two contracting parties, that's a perfectly rational process. All you're doing is, in effect, reifying the pathology of short-term elected officials, externalizing the costs into the future. What the, what the California rule does, and why we're so upset about it, is that to the extent that that's the only rational characterization of the contract that we can come up with, what it does is it constitutionalizes the pathology of the bargaining process. What getting rid of it does is push it back into the political process. It doesn't guarantee a better outcome as, <laughs> as we all watch the news. Um, but it at least gets out of the problem of having created a constitutional rule that 
imposes a kind of contract which, from the perspective I'm arguing, is rational to the bargaining parties, but as far as the system is concerned, makes no sense at all. Um, the, what's so crazy about it is that it's a rule that says, I can fire people, I can lower their wages, I just, just can't change the future accrual rate. But can you increase contribution? I can do, any, I can do anything I want. I just, I just can't do that one thing. And it's one of the reasons I characterize the judicial opinions as vacuous. Because I don't think you can get there any other way than through a bargaining process in which the public, in which the public official is, is, is generating optionality for their own position. Uh, let's get Henry Aaron. OK, uh, first a factual point, and then a question that's going to come back at you on this argument. The factual point is that uh, from a legal standpoint, uh, a number of people have stated something contrary to law, which is that there is a Social Security unfunded liability, and that there is a Medicare hospital insurance unfunded liability. As a matter of law, there is neither, since neither fund can spend, uh, make commitments beyond revenues and accumulated reserves. Uh, what you're referring to is a gap between projected benefits uh, on a law different from the one that is actually in existence and revenues under the law that is actually in existence. And in that kind of a situation, you can get an imbalance. But the law is written that benefits cannot be paid in excess of revenues and accumulated reserves. Therefore, there is no unfunded liability in Social Security or Medicare hospital insurance. Things are more complicated with the other parts of Medicare, and I'm not going to go into those now. I could understand a contract being written, and it doesn't strike me as at all irrational, under which the parties say, look, uh, we're hiring you. Uh, there are certain circumstances under which we can let you go. Uh, we're not contracting with you as to the level of your wage, but so long as you are employed by us, based on the level of your wage and the length of your service, here's the formula that we're going to use to pay your pension. <coughs> Nothing irrational about that. Uh, as you point out, it might be judged by some to be imprudent. It isn't obvious to me that it is imprudent. It's a commitment uh, to link a pension to the cash compensation that people receive and the duration of their employment. So uh, if one interprets, the, uh, th th that raises the question of what exactly was the contract at the time people were employed. Now, if it was what I am describing, it seems to me that one impairs that contract uh, at very great risk to the contract clause. Because it would, under that interpretation, be a legitimate agreement between knowing parties on both sides, not at all crazy, uh, and along you would come and say, well, circumstances were, it's not a matter of uh, the entity going into bankruptcy, whatever the consequences of that as a result of this contract. But even if you're not bankrupt, we're going to relieve you of the requirement that you honor that duly agreed contract. Now, you can come back, and I know nothing about the exact circumstances under which the contract was negotiated. If it was different from what I'm describing, then everything I've just said is you can disregard, I think. Yeah, sure. But, um, the problem with this is that in the contract clause context where the uh, a public entity is the contracting party as opposed to private contract with the public um, with the state interfering with a private contract is that you have to decide what is the contract, right? So you have to decide not just what was the negotiation, but also where do you look? Where's the written contract? It's not just a printed document that has the signatures of two parties. It's uh, in frequently found in statute. And as a principle of law, there is a reluctance to find in statute contract under the contract clause unless it is expressly stated as such. So we've got a couple of different contexts. One we have in San Jose. Contract includes not just the collective bargaining agreement, but also the city charter. Charter says that the pension uh, accruals and rates and uh, benefits can be adjusted upward and downward. 
So to say that the San Jose changes are subject to the contract clause in light of the charter seems to me to be uh, legally impermissible. If you've got a, but then you've got a second, second situation where all you have is the collective bargaining agreement and the schedule and you're silent as to anything, and any other aspect. I agree with you. I think that, that is a, it's a hard question to determine, well, was the intention, which has to be clear, again, separate from private parties, there's an additional burden to find contract in statute. Was the intention not just to create a contract that we understand the term to mean in a private context, was the intention by the state to create a contract clause contract? And there, given uh, court's reluctance to find that unless expressly stated, that's where I think this is a hard decision. Okay. And I think that our paper is trying to say that this is a decision rule for hard cases. And I, I appreciate your, your comment on this because I think for a lot of people, uh, you know, the economic logic of it might present some barriers to thinking, okay, well, this is obviously bad, and this is obviously corrupt. And indeed, a frequent uh, anecdote that's prayed it out is that one, the, when this was challenged in Orange County in the mid-90s, the lawyer on behalf of the public employees, a former judge, said, I think, I don't know if this is actually true, this is, but this is repeated. I've heard this uh, uh, many, many, many times. Said, well, let me put a fine point on the legal argument. This is about my pension, and this is about your pension and then sat down or something like that. <laughs> Apocryphal or not, it brings the, it brings the point to the head, which is to say, um, is this a bunch of, of uh, moron judges making decisions out of their own best interests? Or is there actually some legal meat to this? I think there's legal meat to this. And so our paper is a bit of a theoretical imposition and intervention that says, when you've got a tricky issue, in light of the fact that this is a fiscal policy making process, how do you resolve hard questions? Uh, and I would say you do it in a way that doesn't, doesn't uh, reify, doesn't constitutionalize something that may have been the product not of necessarily uh, uh, rational decision making, but in uh, uh, the consequence of, of a political pathology. Very, very quickly in just seconds, um, to Josh's point, why wasn't there ex ante specification? I mean, uh, a time machine is the thing to answer that. I think that there wasn't at the time, and it left a gap, and courts are in the business of filling gaps in, in contracts. And so uh, that leaves the question, because this is an issue of contract clause, uh, you have to fill in those gaps under contract clause. Um, to Ted's point about numbers, I think it's absolutely true. There are bigger fish to fry in terms of the sheer uh, girth of, of unfunded liabilities and other aspects. But what's important to remember here, institutionally speaking, is that this is a concern for cities and states, whereas although the implications of, of Medicare, et cetera, um, are, are felt by all, uh, that's a, at a national level. And the, the different lever, levers and legal aspects are, are also different. Bankruptcy, that's a whole topic for another time, to be sure. Um, but there, uh, at bankruptcy, there is, I, I think that might be the only aspect of constitutional under the contracts clause where municipal bankruptcy, I mean, that bankruptcy exists to impair contracts. And uh, chapter nine of the bankruptcy code, under which municipalities can file for bankruptcy subject to several uh, constrictions in federal and state law, uh, was challenged in the 1930s on the basis of an impairment of contract clause and the Supreme Court said, yes, Chapter 9 is unconstitutional, well, Chapter 9's predecessor. And then three years later said, you know what, no, we're going to change course. It is constitutional. And so we've been operating under that assumption for about 80 years. Um, so bankruptcy, I think, represents an op option for um, uh, insolvent municipalities to, uh, to modify. There will be litigation around that. And what happens out of Detroit is going to tell, tell us a lot. The problem is, is that's not a costless modification. Uh, entering bankruptcy has very severe uh, uh, it's very expensive in a litigation sense, but it's also, it, 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 you can't cherry pick within the, the municipal <coughs> bankruptcy context. It's, uh, it's modifying, modifying debts across the board and can have serious implications for uh, a municipality's vitality uh, going forward. So I'll, I'll uh, stop there. And, uh, okay, we have 1.1 1 .1 additional questions, and Olivia gets the one, and Alicia gets the point one. <laughs> As it should be, of course. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, your last point, Peter, I, was something that I wanted to come to. If my colleague David Skeel were here from the law school at Penn, uh, I think what he would say is that we have a much broader discussion that we haven't really settled, which is municipalities can go bankrupt, but states, we just don't know. There's very little precedent for it. And in particular, there's not a lot of information about what the rights of the 
state public pensioners would be in that case. And in fact, perhaps a bit tongue in cheek, David argues that it would be a good idea to have a state bankruptcy to help clarify and thereby make it more straightforward so that the different parties would know where they stood in making the contracts for the future. Um, the other, only other point I would make in passing is that um, when we look at the trends uh, and argue that DB plans are still the norm in the public sector, one question I would put to anybody, maybe Josh, is do those examinations of historical trends take into account the fact that a lot of jobs that used to be public sector jobs don't exist in the public sector anymore? In other words, the public sector certainly hasn't grow, been growing. It's been shrinking in many cases. Prisons are now operated by hotel chains and so forth. And you know they don't pay them to find benefit plan, plan, plan pensions, and much less in terms of wages as well. So I think we shouldn't lose fact of the sight of the, the sight of the fact that defined benefit pensions are not covering a lot of the people that used to be public sector workers. Alicia. Thank you. Yes, I just have one question. I really enjoyed your presentation. Now that I know your number. You're really in trouble. Um, <laughs> the, the California law is the most strict, or I guess New York too, but generally it's very hard to change future benefits for uh, current employees throughout the nation. Not as hard as here, but generally. Um, and so I was just stunned during this wake of the financial crisis that uh, courts upheld eliminating COLAs, cost of living adjustments, because uh, I always thought those were sort of accrued benefits already. Were you surprised by that trend? So, uh, surprise and not. Remember that the um, health care litigation that, uh, uh, you know, the, the Obamacare decision comes with a, a nice dig at the entire economics profession by Chief Justice Roberts where he says that there might be no economic distinction between a mandate to engage in certain activity and a mandate not to engage in the converse of that activity, but we're not economists here. So, lawyers... Lawyers are very comfortable using formalisms to uh, distinguish uh, between uh, uh, practices that are undistinguishable econ economically. I think there's a bit more to it than that simply because the COLAs are expressly linked uh, intellectually, even though some of the COLAs, uh, are, most of the COLAs aren't, aren't um, pegged to inflation at all. But to the idea that this is an increase to costs of living as opposed to linked to the benefits that accrue over a certain tenure of, uh, of service. So there is a distinction there between them. But I think the economic logic here that's so interesting is that many colas, and Josh knows more about this than I do, uh, aren't, there, I mean, maybe no colas are pegged to inflation expressly. Some are. But most are not. Most are saying, you know, cola is going to be X percent per year, and it's just a, a projective. I might be wrong about that. Are they pegged? Some of each. Yeah, all right. Let me, let me get back then to, um, to Olivia's point. So David is my um, uh, a dear friend, and he and I edited a book together about, about these, and we've talked a lot about state bankruptcy. And just to clarify, states cannot, under law, file for bankruptcy. They can't. There's no question about that. Um, a state that tried to would, it, by the nature of municipal bankruptcy, Chapter 9 bankruptcy, it's a two-step process, unlike in corporate bankruptcy, that goes through an eligibility hearing, uh, the consequence of which is, is profound, um, followed by a plan confirmation hearing, which is the stuff of bankruptcy generally, where you get classes of people voting uh, to accept or not the plan with a cram down for those who vote against it, subject to certain kinds of constraints. So states cannot. What David would say, and he's not at all tongue-in-cheek, is that should change. States should absolutely be able to file for bankruptcy. The, the constitutional history of, of the bankruptcy code suggests that the likelihood of that happening, even if it could get through the political process, which is uh, so with bondholders and unions both against, is uh, very unlikely. Um, I don't know that, that would, uh, it would pass constitutional muster, um, even if it were voluntary um, on the entire idea of this, this concept somewhat nebulously defined as equal sovereignty meaning that states cannot cede the sovereignty that they have for the fiscal policy-making apparatus to the federal judiciary, even if they want to. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I love David. He's, uh, he's brilliant and has done just tremendous work on this. I just think he's wrong on this. Uh, I, I think that even if the policy would point in that direction, I think the law is not with him. 
Okay, let's take a break until 10 after 3.